A few months ago, I made a review of a Maserati Ghibli, and I pointed out that it wasn't a very good car. I later had roughly the same opinion of a Maserati Quattroporte, and I wasn't particularly kind to the Levante either. But Maserati hasn't always built crap, and this 1971 Maserati Ghibli is proof. I've borrowed this Ghibli from Tamini Classics here in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, which has an amazing inventory of cars from modern exotics to million dollar classics. Now, I chose to film with the Ghibli because I wanted to go back to an era when Maserati was special, when they were building beautiful cars with amazing performance. And the Ghibli is that. The Ghibli was sold from 1967 to 1973, but this is the one you want, the Ghibli SS, which came out in 19. While the standard Ghibli had 300 horsepower, the SS had a larger engine, 4.9 liter V8, with 330 horsepower. And when Joe Walsh sang that famous line, my Maserati does 185, he was probably talking about this car or its successor, the Camzen. Both were being made around that time. Fun fact though, neither of those cars actually did 185. The top speed of this car was 174 and the Camzen was about the same. In fact, it wasn't until 2004 that Maserati actually made a car that does 185. Anyway, if your experience with Maserati comes mostly from the modern models, you're probably wondering what the fuss is all about with the Maserati brand name because frankly, Maserati isn't very good. But today, I'm gonna show you why it used to be good. I'm gonna show you around this car, I'm gonna show you all of its quirks and features, then I'm gonna get it out on the road and drive the original Ghibli, and then I'm gonna give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Ghibli experience, click the link below to go to autotrader.com oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of some of the odd and unusual 1970s and 80s Maseratis you've probably never heard of. Now, this car has a lot of interesting and unusual quirks, as you might expect from a 60s, 70s Italian car. I'm gonna start with the door panel. Now, the door handle is a little bit of a quirk in itself. It's sort of hidden. You pull it up and the door opens. That's not the coolest thing on the door panel. That honor goes to the quarter window. Now, the quarter window is the coolest thing in these older cars. You could twist it open and then you had a little airflow through the cabin. I wish someone would bring that back. The cool part about this quarter window is how it opens. You twist this little chrome dial in order to open it and close it instead of actually pushing on the window itself. It's a nice little touch. I think it's a very handsome way to open and close that window. Also interesting on the door panel. How about the little plug for where the manual window roller would have been if this car didn't have power windows? Instead of creating an entirely new door panel for the power window cars, Maserati was just like, nah, let's put a plug over it. That'll do. Moving further inside, we get onto one of the most bizarre Ghibli details, and that would be the lights and switches to the left of the steering wheel all of which are unlabeled. I'm serious. So there's like four lights over here and a couple other lights and some switches and a little dial and we have no idea what they do because Maserati isn't telling us. Fortunately, some prior owner of this car, surely a German, laid out every single button and switch in this car and what it does because he was so confused by it. The result is that only because of that do we know what all those lights and switches do. Interestingly, this diagram also labels the front fogs and in parentheses under dash, that's where the front fog are located, or should I say hidden, because Maserati didn't really make it clear that they're down there, and once again, they didn't label them. Moving further into the car for some more unusual quirks, we must next focus on the steering column and the fact that it is adjustable. Unlike every Italian car from this era where I often have trouble fitting in as someone who's tall, this steering column I can move. Just twist this little dial underneath the steering column, and then you can adjust it, except there's a problem, this is all the adjustment. That's it, it only goes in and out about an inch <laughs> and it doesn't go up and down. You can see the little cutouts for the turn signals and the other stocks on the steering column and that is exactly how far this thing adjusts. But hey, you know what, at least they tried. And speaking of at least they tried, this car has a parking brake, which is an important component of a stick shift car but they put it in the driver footwell and they didn't hide it over on the side. It's pretty far over there and it's rather large, <laughs> but again, at least it has one. Now, moving further into the car, next we get to the switch for the hazard lights, which is mounted in a very unusual place. It's to the right of the steering wheel in this little afterthought compartment before you get to the actual center switches. Now, there are two possibilities for why it's here. One is that this car wasn't originally delivered with hazard lights, and so these were added aftermarket, which would be crazy because that 
that would mean this car wasn't originally delivered with hazard lights. The other option is that this is actually where Maserati put it, which would also be crazy because it looks ridiculous. Nonetheless, you flip the switch and then this little red light blinks and it lets you know that your hazard lights are on. The other interesting thing down here is the trip odometer reset, which I find absolutely hilarious because as you turn it, you can get the trip odometer to go back to zero, as you'd expect. But if you keep turning it, you can get it to go to basically any repeating number that you want. You want your car to say 1111 or 2222? That's fine. You can do that if you have a Ghibli. Also over here is this little silver button next to the hazard lights. It's unlabeled. In fact, it's not even on that written diagram that's so detailed. I'm afraid to push it. Although when I do push it when the car is running, nothing happens. Maybe it's the automotive equivalent of a fidget spinner. You can just push it when you're driving down the road if you're bored. Next up, moving into the middle of this car, there are a couple of interesting things worth highlighting. One is simply the overall shape and look of the middle of the interior of this car. You have the gauges on top and below that you have all the buttons and then there are the climate vents and below that you have the original stereo. Take a look at this thing. Everybody has swapped out stereos in all these cars over time, but this is the factory stereo. This car came with when it was delivered in France in 1971. One. It even says Maserati on it. That is a cool stereo. Although it's worth noting, it probably can't sync up to your phone using Bluetooth audio. Now, a couple of other interesting things in the center of this car. One of them is the little switch with the gas pump on it. What could that possibly be? Well, that's the switch to switch between fuel tanks. You see, this car has two separate fuel tanks. You can fill it up on the driver's side or on the passenger side. I'll show you that in a second. But the meaning is that you can switch between the fuel tanks. If the driver's side is empty, just press that little switch and suddenly you're using the full passenger side. Now, how do you know when they're empty? There are two individual fuel lights. They're over there on the left panel. I showed them to you before. They're the reserve for the driver's side and the passenger side. When the driver's side reserve light turns on, just flip the switch to the passenger side. Another benefit of this is when you're driving a 71 Ghibli, you don't have to worry about which side of the pump to pull up on because you can pull up on either side. Although it's also a drawback because I guess you can never fully fill the car on one side. You have to fill it and then drive around and fill it on the other side too, which could get annoying. Nonetheless, that's how it's done. Also interesting, over on the very far right of all these things, the switches and the gauges, is a little unlabeled knob. Well, that's the knob for the climate control. You twist it to adjust the temperature of the air that comes out the climate control vents. But you'd only know that if you read the diagram or just poked around it for a while. Now, it's worth noting that that knob only controls the temperature of the air, hot or cold. To control the airflow, to increase or decrease it, or to control where the air comes out, it's those little switches over on the left that I showed you before, also unlabeled. Now, those are a few things that maybe Maserati has gotten wrong in this car, but there are some things they got right. For example, this car has a dimming interior mirror. I've never been in any car from this era that has that, but this one does. It's a very early dimmer, but it works. Also interesting is the fact that this car has power windows, which was pretty common on luxury cars of the time period, but it is kind of cool to see it. The window switches are in the center rather than on the doors themselves. Another interesting Ghibli feature is this little vent. There's one on the driver's side behind the driver, and there's one on the passenger side. And initially I thought they were air conditioning vents, but it turns out when you look through them, you can see the outside of the car. So maybe this is some sort of fresh air vent. I, I don't really know. I'm mentioning this as something the Ghibli has done right, but really it's just more something the Ghibli has done. Another good touch in the Ghibli, you can adjust the headrests, which is tremendous rare on a car from this era, especially an Italian car. Although the process is a little bit cumbersome, it's not exactly like pushing a button in a Mercedes Benz. Instead, you twist this little thing just like in the steering column, except in this case you twist it all the way off, and then you can move the headrest up or down like you're adjusting the seat on a bicycle. When you have it in the place that you want, twist that little thing right back in, and then the headrest is higher or lower depending on where you want it. Now, it's worth noting one interesting thing about that headrest adjustment is that you can clearly see when you pull the headrest all the way out that there are three prongs of adjustment, but when you put it back in, it's fully down in prong number two. So while the headrest is adjustable, technically it's only adjustable at two levels and it looks more adjustable than it actually is. Still, that's a nice little practical touch in the car. Also a practical touch in this car is the vast amount of storage this vehicle has, starting in the passenger side footwell, where there is a storage compartment on the right in front of the passenger door. I've seen a lot of storage compartments in a lot of weird places, but I've never seen one in front of the door itself. Now, this car also has a glove box, and it's kind of cool. It has a weird way that it opens, and it also has kind of an interesting shape, and when you open it, you'll find that it is actually relatively practical. Also in the middle, there's this tiny, incredibly shallow center storage area, but hey, it's there. 
But then we move on to the strangest storage compartment in this vehicle, and that would be behind the seats. Now, this car is a two-seater, but it has a vast storage compartment back there with only one problem. It's not accessible because this car isn't a hatchback. Instead, it has a trunk. More on that in just a second. But in the back, there are a couple of unusual things. Now, when you first glance back there, it looks like just one giant carpeted storage compartment until you actually start poking around. That's when you discover that if you pull up the carpeting behind the driver and passenger seat, you will find these two leather, basically, boxes stuck there in place of the seats. The reason they're there is that when they're in place, they make the entire compartment back there flat. But when you pull them out, it reveals basically fake seats that are inaccessible except for storage. It's very, very weird. And here's the crazy thing. Not only are those fake seats good for storage, but you can lift them up and then there's even more storage. This is really, really strange. It's definitely the strangest thing in the interior of this car. Maserati could have put seats back here or they could have just put some leather wrapped parcel shelf like basically every other car with this configuration. Mercedes SL, Ferrari 550, but instead they put in these fake seats and these little storage things. Oh, and by the way, another really weird and interesting thing about the fake rear seats back there. Maserati even went to the trouble of putting individual rear carpeting on the driver and passenger side behind the front seats. It's almost like they were planning to put rear seats in this car really far along in the design process and then someone said no it's too small that would just be ridiculous and so they got rid of them and instead they put those weird leather boxes back there. They're like leather pillows really. It's very strange. Now, moving on to the outside of the Ghibli, I want to start with the trunk. Now, like I said before, despite the appearance of this car and that giant storage area back there, this is a car with a trunk, not a hatchback. Now, in order to open the trunk, you pull a little latch in the driver's door jam. It's really hidden in there. You got to pull it really hard. And once you do, the trunk unlatches and then you can open it right up and it opens up just like a normal trunk. And in fact, it is a fairly normal trunk with only a couple of exceptions. Number one is this little prop. You actually have to set the prop so that the trunk stays in place, otherwise it'll just keep falling on you. There's no hydraulic struts in this thing. This is the way to keep it open. The other interesting thing about the trunk is that even though it's a trunk and not a hatchback, it opens to the storage area inside the car. It's not separate from the storage area itself. So even though you can't load giant items because you can't open the window, you can still get into the storage area from the trunk area. So that begs the question, why didn't they just make the window open? I strongly suspect it would have had to do with the physical size and weight of the piece that would have had to open for that to work. The weight of the rear window in an enormous hatchback with this body section would have been huge. So instead they said, well, a trunk is all you get. And indeed, this trunk is all you get. There is no lock back here in the trunk, meaning the only way to access the trunk is that little latch inside the car. Meaning if you're walking up to this car with a lot of stuff in your arms, you have to set it down, walk around, unlock the door, pull the latch, walk around back, open the trunk, and then you can put it in, proving that Italian cars have been annoying us since the 1970s. Now, aside from the fact that the trunk has that small opening, the car's not a hatchback, and the fact that it goes through to the interior, there's nothing more particularly interesting about the trunk. When you open up the floor of the trunk, you'll find the usual, a toolkit, a battery, and there's a spare tire back there. And speaking of the spare tire, let's talk about changing the tires in this car. It's kind of interesting. You see that little cap on the wheels? Well, that requires a special large tool in order to get it off. A lot of Italian cars from this era, that was the only cap. You would take the tool, you would undo it, and then you could pull the wheel off, but not this one. In this car, that's a decorative cap. When you take the special tool to that little cap and you pull the cap off, then you reveal the lug nuts and then you have to pull those off too, making roadside tire changes a little bit more frustrating than usual. Next up, I told you I'd show you the dual fuel tanks in this car and well, here they are. You can already see the gas cap on the passenger side and repeated and symmetrically over on the driver's side. Here is the other one. And again, this car had two fuel tanks and you could switch between them when one ran out of fuel with that little switch I showed you in inside the cabin. It's very strange. Next up, moving on to the front of the Ghibli. Now, there's nothing especially interesting under the hood, although the hood itself is front hinged, though that was common for Italian cars back in this time period. Nonetheless, I will still allow you to gaze at the beauty that was a 60s, 70s Maserati Italian V8. This engine is beautiful. And to me, maybe the most beautiful part are these little labels on the side. These labels were put there for regulators to satisfy regulations back in the 60s and 70s, but they've aged so well. Also, there are two other interesting things in the front of this car, both of which would be obvious if you've seen any of my other videos of these vintage Italian exotics from Tamini. One is the horn. Push it and, well, <laughs> The other is also obvious. That would be the headlights. If I turn the switch, the headlights 
we're right up into position. These are the early pop-ups. This was one of the cars that started the trend. We think of pop-ups as an 80s trend, but here it was on a car that came out in the late 60s. Turn the headlights off and the retreat right back into their home. So that's a tour of the Ghibli, but before I move on to driving this car, I wanna talk a little bit about its styling. A lot of people consider this late 60s, early 70s Ghibli to be one of the most beautiful cars ever made, and it's easy to understand why. It has a striking, low slung look that predates most of the exotic cars that have that design. Back when the Ghibli came out, Ferrari was making the 275 GTB and the gigantic 365 GT2 Plus 2, but after the Ghibli, they moved on to the flat, windswept Daytona, undoubtedly influenced by the Ghibli's look. The Ghibli was designed by Marcello Gandini, who also designed the Lamborghini Mira and the original Kuhn. Anyway, time to drive. All right, let's do this. You ready? Brakes off, brake light is off. Let's drive this thing. The first thing I noticed, I've driven a lot of these Italian, older Italian cars over the last couple of days out here. The first thing I noticed is just how much more tremendously comfortable this one is. Just sitting here in the seat, I mean, I have room finally. And some of the other cars was like, whoa, I have headroom. In this car, I got headroom, I got legroom, I got knee room. I can turn the wheel without it affecting my knee. I mean, this is, this is perfect. All these cars and their, their engine sounds are unbelievable. Boy, the brakes are actually surprisingly good, much better than any of the other Italian exotics I've, I've driven this week. Quite impressive. Uh, there's, there's The brake pedal feel kind of sucks when you push it down about three inches before anything happens, but once you actually get into it, uh, it really does, uh, it does work. Yeah, I'm really surprised at the driving position of this car. Uh, it, it feels, this actually feels like a truly drivable car. All the other ones was like, I gotta bend my knees a little bit, the seat was comfortable, but my knees weren't, or my head wasn't, or whatever. This one, I finally feel like I could just sit here. Now, at a stoplight, as we're sitting here in the stoplight, the car is shaking like crazy, and that's because we've decided to run the air conditioning and the compressor is kicked on, and it's really kind of shaking it around. I'm told when the car warms up, it gets a little bit smoother. Uh, right now, it's actually kind of funny. It feels like we're sitting on a washing machine or something. I'm going over a bump here, and I don't really have to slow down. This, this car didn't have one of those crazy low wedge shapes like Lamborghinis, Ferraris of that era. A passenger side mirror would be nice. Man, the sound is so good. Oh, wow. Woo. That's got quite a note to it. Quite an engine note. I'm a little afraid to... Man, driving this thing through a tunnel, it really feels like the 60s come to life. I mean, this is what sports cars sounded like back then. And it feels amazing. It sounds so cool. It actually feels pretty stable going probably faster than I should around this corner. It's a little squirrely, it's a little vague. I mean, that's a reality of most of the cars of this era. I got myself into this one, didn't I? Woo! <laughs> it's not slow, I would say. It feels actually pretty quick, but mostly it just sounds amazing. Now here we are, sort of a higher gear at a, at a higher speed, low rev. Feels like a nice kind of touring car feel. This car has sort of a weird character to it in the sense that it's a two-seater and it has that great sound, but it's also a, uh, a kind of a touring car. It's less of like a true crazy fast sports car. The mirror would be nicer if the mirror was larger. That's, oh wow. That's a, uh, that's kind of a pathetic little mirror there. Of course, it's very difficult to adjust. You gotta roll down the window and reach outside. There's no, uh, there's no power adjustment for this stuff. The people at Tomini were telling me this car sort of has a muscle car feel to it. It's a big front engine, big engine. I mean, it's a large 4.9 liter V8, big V8, big sound to it. And uh, I can understand that. It also has, in, the muscle cars also were, were sort of more comfortable. They were made for larger people. Uh, and that, that this car is that. Oh! Man, that sound is so good. And what's really good is when I push the clutch and go for the next gear and you can hear it coming down, it just sounds like those those movies that, you know, it's from the 60s and 70s when you heard those cars going around. I mean, it's amazing to feel like you're doing that. You know, modern cars sound amazing, but but these cars sound amazing in a different way, and it's very, very cool and very special. This may not be the fastest, and it doesn't have the Ferrari badge or the Lamborghini badge, but it's certainly the most drivable. And so that's the 1971 Maserati Ghibli SS, a Maserati from back when Maseratis were cool, special, beautiful, Italian cars, not lease deals that pop up on banner ads when you're booking Caribbean cruises online. This was a real Maserati, and yes, they do exist. 
and now it's time to give this one a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Ghibli is a beautiful car, hurt only by those odd fake wheel caps and the fact that it's certainly starting to show its age. Still, this is one of the greats and it gets an 8 out of 10. Next up is acceleration, the Ghibli SS does 0 to 60 in 6.2 seconds, earning it a 3 out of 10. Next up is handling, the Ghibli is very nice, relatively secure, but also somewhat vague, like a lot of the exotic cars of this time period when judged by modern standards, it gets a 5 out of 10. As for cool factor, this is among the cooler vintage Maserati models and certainly one of the best known and it earns an 8 out of 10. Same deal for importance, most older Maserati models are not especially important, but the Ghibli's gorgeous styling helped usher in a new era and it earns an 8 out of 10, bringing the total weekend score to 32 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. The Ghibli has climate control and a radio, but not much more by modern standards and it gets a 2 out of 10. Then there's comfort. The Ghibli is fine with a surprisingly roomy cabin, but it hardly coddles the way a modern luxury car would, or even a new Honda Accord would, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Next up is quality, where the Ghibli does okay. The interior is nice, but not gorgeous, and I'd worry about maintaining and repairing the engine with any regular driving, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Practicality is decent. There are only two seats, but there's a huge cargo area. Unfortunately, actually accessing that cargo area is a problem, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Finally, there's value. A nice Ghibli can sell these days for $200,000 to $250,000, which is a huge amount of money. And while it's a beautiful car, I honestly think its collectability is being harmed by Maserati's current lineup, as it's just not as desirable since Maserati is no longer a highly aspirational automaker like it was back when this car was new. With that in mind, it gets only a 5 out of 10, bringing the total daily score to 19 out of 50. Add it all up, and the total Doug score is... 51 out of 100, which predictably places the Ghibli in the lower third of cars I review. In spite of that, it's still pretty special, especially compared to the latest Maseratis.